Open Project or Simply BAP and our third open webinar. For those who are not familiar with BAP, just a short information. BAP is an international platform, 100% dedicated to the research of the aquatic environments and their inhabitants to the vocation of the biotop aquarium concept. The creation based on such aquatic research. The BAP offers a freemium based content which means some of it is free access and other can be accessed on the subscription basis. We invite you to visit Biotop Aquarium Project website and especially our section articles. You will find lots of unique contents that will help you to understand and to cre recreate hundreds of biotopes. Once again, welcome our dear participants and let's give a warm welcome to our special guest tonight, Ty. Streetman and welcome Michael Salter who will be our host. Hi, thanks very much Amanda for the lovely introduction. Uh, well today we have um, a great guest who I have seen um, a lot of footage from and I just uh, I can't say enough good things uh, about what I'm seeing. Uh, this is Mattis Ty Streetman who is a British biologist um, and an aquarist who has uh, spent 13 years visiting Brazil and exploring its waters in various other aquatic habitats around the world as well. So his main uh, focus of research is the Salobra River in the Pantanal wetlands, and he's formed his thesis, based, uh, thesis basis for his master's in animal biology from the Federal University of Mato Grosso. Okay, so uh, Ty has been fascinated by all things fish since the age of two, um, okay, exploring uh, rivers, streams, ponds, uh, whenever he could. And after uh, completing uh, his bachelor's in Latin American Development Studies at the University of Portsmouth, UK, he spent time working as an aquarist at the London Zoo and is a regular contributor to Practical Fish Keeping Magazine, which I'm sure uh, many of you all know and, and probably uh, know a few people from as well. He's also co-founder of the Freshwater Life Project, an NGO dedicated to preserving freshwater habitats around the world. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Ty Streetman. Is that for me to take over? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Hello everyone, you are I, will, uh, now. I will share my screen here and begin right. our, our presentation. Thank you. So you guys can see that. Let's go. So I'm going yes. to be talking about uh, the habitats and fishes of the uh, Salobita River Delta. Um, I've divided the presentation into two parts, where the first part I'm talking more about uh, the habitats and the environment, and the second part I'm going to be talking uh, about the species I found there. Um, after the first part, I think Michael is going to step in um, and uh, if there are any questions, we'll receive at that point. Um, and then I think there will be an opportunity for questions at the end as well. So if, if it's okay, I shall, uh, shall begin. Yes, please. All right, so a bit of a general background. Um, as probably many people know, Brazil is incredibly rich in terms of uh, its ichthyofauna. Um, we know about 3,000 freshwater species, but it's estimated that there are perhaps up to 9,000, just a large number haven't yet been uh, discovered. And where I'm based, near the Pantanal wetlands in the interior of Brazil, uh, it's this fantastic bio biome. It uh, experiences a flood pulse uh, cycle. Um, it's around 14,000 square kilometers and the majority of it is flooded um, and the changes that the floods bring about are what supports such uh, diversity and also abundance of, of fish here. So let me go here. So the Salobra Delta River, sorry, the Salobra River Delta where I work is at the very sort of southern tip of the Pantanal um, and it's incredibly rich, incredibly biodiverse. Um, and this is largely because it's the only river in the state where fishing is prohibited. Um, and because of that, uh, we have a huge abundance, particularly of larger species. And also we see fish that we don't encounter very often or in large numbers in other rivers here. Uh, I've, in the last sort of three years, I've identified uh, 103 different species. Um, and considering that the Pantanal contains 270 to 300 species, um, that's, that's quite a lot of fish uh, in one river, uh, 
the percentage of, of the species. Okay. So here you can see the floodplain of the Salopa River during the dry season. You can see the river cutting through this savanna landscape. And there's ancillary forest, corridor forest that follows the river channel. And there's uh, forest further out. Um, so this is in the dry season. It's, it's very much a Sahado savanna landscape. Um, but this all floods in the wet season. And so in the top photo here, you can see the river at uh, high water. Uh, you have these huge bent beds of uh, water hyacinth. Um, and then in the lower, in the little gif at the bottom, um, you see water when it's uh, in the dry season, the banks are left high and dry, there's root networks um, exposed. And we're going to have a look at those carefully. So the wet season here uh, is really November to May and uh, the Salobra flows northeast and drains into the larger Miranda River. So this whole region becomes uh, flooded. And along the course of the Salobra, we have uh, oxbow lakes, we have water meadows, we get uh, forests, um, and all the trees obviously create uh, complex habitat, uh, lianas, and sunken roots and sunken logs. There's uh, temporary ponds and ditches and there's small drainage streams. And during the wet season, the water is quite clear and you get lots of sunlight penetration, which means there's lots of aquatic vegetation. Um, the uh, Iconia crassitis, which is the water hyacinth, and Ceratophyllum demersum, which we know as hornworts, which is a very common, ubiquitous plant. We find that. Uh, there's two species of uh, lily I've identified there, that's Nymphaea amazonicum and Nymphaea uh, gardneriana. And you usually find those in the, in the lagoons during the wet season. So in the, and in the dry season, sort of from the end of May up, running up to November, the river channel really shrinks down and the current increases as the water retreats from the countryside back into the main river channel. And the increased current um, means that sediment and, and detritus doesn't sink to the bottom. So the water remains quite turbid, very murky. This obviously restricts sunlight penetration. So a lot of the aquatic plants die back. Um, and as the water level falls, lots of marginal plants are left to dry out. Um, where we previously had beds of, of water lilies, now we end up with exposed sand. Um, and any areas of leaf litter, because of the increased current, the leaves are also lifted up and taken away. So the riverbed, in many ways, it's much less diverse uh, in terms of macro habitats during the dry season. And this also means that there's much less food available for various species. So we've got lots of different uh, marginal plants. Ludwigia, polygonum, grow along the, the, the edges of the, the river and the bodies of water. And so you get this really sort of structural complex habitat of uh, submerged terrestrial plants, semi-aquatic plants, fully aquatic plants, and um, flooding the landscape along the river. And the fish leave the main river channel and they move into this flooded landscape where they can find new, uh, new resources. So they find uh, new food and, and uh, habitat to occupy. So they eat lots of seeds and berries and insects and nuts. And actually, uh, in the Pantanal, at least, fish are one of the most important uh, seed dispersers, uh, as important, say, as birds, because they leave the main river channel in the wet season, they go out, they eat all, this, uh, all the seeds and the fruits they find, and they move further away into the flooded landscape, they uh, deposit the seeds, and when the, the waters retreat, it's left behind this rich bed of silt, which is nut nutritious for the seeds. Um, and then new forest grows. So often you will find forest growing very, very far away from the main river channel that has its origins in being deposited by, uh, by fish. Um, because of all this additional food, we get huge uh, agglomerations of, of small fishes as well. You can see sort of swarms of small caracins. And so as I've said, the wet season is the time of plenty. And in the main river channel, we've got lots of large species and many smaller fish which will now leave the channel and move into the surrounding wetlands to take advantage of those oloclonus items, insects, seeds, fruits, nuts, also algae growing on the submerged leaves of terrestrial plants. Um, and in this uh, video here, you can see an area of the river where the, the, the bank has been flooded and uh, fish are occupying the habitat there. So the river is really the lifeblood of the delta. Nothing else happens without it. Uh, all the other bodies of water exist pretty much because the river is there. Um, and 
As it floods, it provides new habitat. You can see here the sunken root networks, uh, submerged terrestrial vegetation. Um, but it's not a case that it floods and stays flooded, uh, depending on how much rain and how frequent the volume, the water levels can rise and fall over time. So one week we go and we see the bank is, is submerged, as you see here, and the next week you're there and it's high and dry again. And then a week later, it's submerged again. Um, and this sort of uh, changing dynamic is, uh, is what's so intriguing about this habitat. So as the waters are, are rising, uh, the actual current of the river slows down because its waters are dispersed over a much larger area. And what happens is you get this huge deposit of nutrients or the silt or the uh, organic material that was carried in the rivers deposited on the soil. And that is essentially what sustains a boom in terms of plant growth, which also provides food and habitat for many species, both in and out of the water. And the nice thing for me is that the visibility improves, so it's much easier to, uh, to film and photograph. So here you can see, um, this is actually a lawn in front of a, a lodge that's been flooded. Um, and you can see tetras and, and, and dorado and other species uh, just flowing across it in about 20 centimeters of water. Um, so here's the, the lodge that I mentioned, and we here get these small fishes moving in, but you also get larger species will come into the floodwaters. So we've got uh, stingrays here, we have freshwater rays, um, and they will move up the bank, and there's lots of holes in the bank where they hunt the crustaceans. And we also have the famous uh, Kaira, the wolffish, Hopis misonera, which you see here, uh, which will also follow fish out of the main river channel into the flooded habitat. And it's, uh, it's an ambush predator, it lies very, very still until it uh, launches its attack. So along the edges of the, the river, we've got this terrestrial vegetation, um, and this becomes flooded and is also lifted up by the rising water, and you get a, a completely new world of habitat also underneath the plants. And along the bank, you'll have areas of dense vegetation, then you'll have areas of sort of exposed clay, uh, perhaps with a little bit of uh, leaf litter and uh, branches and roots on it, um, elsewhere, you'll find quite deep beds of leaf litter in gullies, um, and that uh, decaying organic material sustains lots of invertebrates, macroinvertebrates, which in turn sustain many small fish, which feed the larger fish. It's a classic uh, food chain. Um, as the waters are clearer, the density of, of aquatic plants increases considerably. So here you can see the Ceratophyllum demersum. Uh, on the left, it's being used as nursery by piranha. Uh, they tend to uh, spawn there and the, the young piranha live in there. And on the right, it's being used as cover by a wolf fish hoping to, uh, to ambush somebody. Um, and this is this explosive growth uh, from this plant. There's just so, so, much, uh, so many nutrients in the water column. Um, there's so much decaying material. And as probably many of you know, hornworts is a really uh, tough and uh, resilient plant. So it does very well in pretty much all conditions. But in the wet season is the best time to go and see it in, uh, in these large uh, beds. So the river channel in the dry season, this is a different, uh, completely different dynamic. Dry season represents hard times for the fish. As the waters recede back into the main river channel, they lose access to all those oloclonus items, all the insects and fruits and, and berries that they had out in the water meadows and in the flooded forest. They lose access to uh, holes in the bank, uh, burrows, root networks, uh, leaf litter, um, and what's left behind largely uh, are, is open sand, particularly along shallow areas of the bank, uh, where we tend to find species such as uh, Corydoras catfish. Um, and as the water is shallower and the fish are concentrated in the channels, it makes life difficult because they're much easier for predators to target. Um, so not only do they have less to eat, but they have a larger chance of being eaten, which is, isn't great. So we're left with this sort of largely exposed clay, but here and there we have uh, some ceratophyllamite still growing, although it's now covered in, in detritus. Um, and we find in some gullies and, and, and crannies in the riverbed, uh, lots of uh, loricarids, armored catfish. Uh, on the open sand beds that have now remain, you often see stingrays uh, hunting. Uh, and it's a bit more difficult to see things because the water is more turbid, but Sometimes um, you go and for some reason it's clearer and you get to see some, some really interesting things. 
along the margins of the river, um, there's lots of inlets and small streams that drain into it uh, that would be draining the meadows and they dry up, um, often not completely. So the, the, the substrate remains humid and you get this very bad smelling, fetid, silt, this sort of mucky habitat. Um, and the water hyacinth, which is growing on the banks, is now barely in any water, perhaps a few millimeters. It's being burned by the sun. Lots of it dies off. And so you've got this natural compost, which uh, supports the growth of lots and lots of macroinvertebrates, lots of nematodes. Um, and then you find in this barely any water, in more mud than water, uh, lots of small catfish like uh, Scoloplax impusa, Corridorus, uh, Pseudobonocephalus, which are the small banjo catfish. And we catch them with these uh, gold panning sieves. You thrust it into the silt and lift them up and it's you know, full of squirming uh, silurid forms. And um, so yeah, it's quite a, although it doesn't appear very hospitable to fish, it often has quite a large number of small fishes living in it. So this is uh, exactly one of those inlets where I've put in, my colleagues put in the sieve. And as you can see, a lot of it is already above water. There's still some murky water around. And um, we catch lots of corridors here. And under, in the wet season, this habitat would be submerged and all the branches and twigs that you're seeing there, they would be underwater. So the exposed sand beds that remain it, uh, still provide habitat. So we see uh, species such as Epistogramma uh, combre hanging around whatever leaf litter remains. Uh, we've got Rhino loricaria, I think it's Rhino loricaria parva here. Um, you can sort of find very well camouflaged feeding out over the open sand. Uh, we've still got stingrays that are now hunting for crustacea and mollusks in this sort of beds of sa sand and clay. But uh, I think my favorite thing perhaps at this time of year is, is, is the corridors because the water is very shallow. You've got these, these sandbanks and you can lie on them with your chest um, and just stay still and uh, the quarries will come up and feed. And it's interesting here, you can see what we call a, a nuclear follower relationship. So the quarries are disturbing the substrate there. And as they forage, um, small bits of uh, edible detritus, perhaps macroinvertebrates are uncovered, are caught by the flow. And the tetras, such as the Hephaestobryconeches, the, the, the serpent tetra, follow them, hoping to grab these bits under the current. Um, on the right, we've got a similar relationship. Actually, you can see a Ranularicari there is being uh, disturbed by the corridoras. Um, and the cichlids will also follow uh, the catfish around hoping to uh, snaffle up any exposed morsels. And the nice thing about this is you think if you wanted to create a biotope at home, it's pretty easy. Uh, uh, river sand, some bits of maker, a large group of corridors, and you've got a, uh, an authentic uh, biotope. So into the main river channel, we have several tributaries. There's three main tributaries in the uh, Salobra River Delta. Um, and in the wet season, they also flood. Um, they look much more like a, a small river and then the water meadows all along them and, along, and the forests around them are also uh, submerged. And you can see uh, lots of terrestrial vegetation is, is uh, left underwater. Uh, this is really interesting dynamic habitat. Lots of fish will go into this habitat to breed and raise uh, fry here. And smaller fishes move in to take advantage of whatever items, uh, food they can find and cover from the predators who are in the, in the main river. So here uh, you can see the lodge where, where I work, it's called the Hefugio da Ilha. And um, on either side of it are man-made reservoirs, which have now flooded completely and they've linked up to the flooded meadows. And then you can see the Salob Salobla River on the left, uh, going, winding sort of uh, south and going north, northwest. And almost in sort of the, the top of the, the, the photo, you can see areas of water that's water flooding from the, the Salobrina tributary, which enters the Salobra on the, uh, the top left of the photo. So what was once uh, some lakes and a small tributary and a, and a river all separated now blend into one very large uh, habitat. So these, this is one of the tributaries here. You can see in the wet season, it's still quite shallow, um, but the water is fairly clear. Uh, there's lots of uh, root networks from, from plants and lots of detritus, organic material, which provides uh, food for small fishes, small tetras. Um, and this is quite an interesting habitat because I think at this point it was the sort of beginning of the wet season. So aquatic vegetation hadn't yet filled the channel. So you've still got quite a lot of light uh, in the water. 
Uh, but the fish are already in there looking for whatever they can find. There's some needlefish uh, swimming around, hoping to uh, catch small fishes as well. And um, you get lots of juvenile fish. So juvenile uh, Brightcomb hilari and Propylodus will also enter the tributary uh, where they can, it's a, it's a safe haven uh, when compared to the main river channel. In the dry season, uh, things change a bit. So the, the top uh, clip is still sort of wet, wet season time, uh, but you can see the water is already becoming much more uh, murky as, as the water level falls. Um, and then a couple of weeks later to a month later, you can see that the tributary is now just a series of sort of pools and puddles barely linked up. Um, all the water hyacinth there has dropped down and uh, fish that had left in these isolated pools, many of them perish, they're eaten by birds, they die of lack of oxygen, um, they perish in the heat. Um, so it's, it's quite a precarious habitat. In the wet season, it's a good place to be in, in the dry season, it, it really isn't. Uh, here you can see quite clearly the sort of progression in the dry season. So initially the tributary, uh, the water's drained from the, the surrounding landscape back into the channel. The water's there, it's fairly stagnant, it's not particularly uh, deep. Um, there's still quite a few fish there, sicklings often tend to thrive here quite well. Uh, as the dry season progresses, the water is produced even further. The remaining aquatic plants sort of pull down into the, into the remaining channel. Um, there are very few uh, fish here still surviving. Um, and then by the late period of the dry season, there's no water and terrestrial vegetation has completely filled the, the channel of the tributary um, and you won't find any fish at this point. Another important habitat in the Slobra Delta are the lagoons. So these are locally what we call bayers. They're normally linked to the main river channel. They're sort of large lake-like habitats. Um, they can actually have flow because water can be entering them from the countryside, uh, for instance, uh, flood waters draining into them. And then from the lagoon, it drains back into the river or as they're filling up, water from the river drains into the lagoons. So you do get a flow moving between them. And this tends to uh, carry lots of nutrients, carry different food items. And many fish, as the lagoons are deeper in the wet season, will enter them uh, because there's some fairly safe areas. Uh, there's lots of deep water, large shoals of Corimba, Procolotus lineatus, uh, stingrays will move into them. And the banks of the lagoons are also submerged. The water extends back out into the meadows and the forests. So they're quite uh, ideal habitat for many species. Uh, this is one of the, uh, this is the Bahia de Tasha. So it's large lotic habitat. Um, connected to the river in the, in the wet season, but in the dry season they can become cut off and they, in extreme cases they can almost drain completely. Um, here you can see in the wet season uh, along the banks there is, uh, the water is quite dark but it's shaded by the forest. Um, there's still hornwork growing there and various fish will sort of weave in amongst the fronds. Uh, it's a good place to, to try and avoid predators. Um, we get cichlids such as uh, Satanoperca papaterha move in because the, the substrate at this time is very rich full of organic material and they filter it for food items. We get piranha coming from the river as well following uh, their prey items. Um, we've got the freshwater barracuda, the golden dogfish, Acestrahincus uh, pantanero will also come in to try and trap fish against the banks. And uh, there's many other fishes that will come in and predate on insects at surface because the lagoons are, are lotic, the water surface is, is still it's much easier for them to, to sight and, and leap for insects. And often along the edges, under the aquatic plants, uh, the floating aquatic plants, you see Oscar cichlids, Astronautus crassipinis, kind of hiding out in the shallows. So in the wet season, when the waters are clear in the lagoons, we get lots of uh, macrophytes, lots of aquatic vegetation, particularly water lilies. Um, and they provide a really interesting dynamic. And this is perhaps another great opportunity to create biotopes is we often think as lilies perhaps in an aquarium as a, as a feature plant or you know something to really catch our eye but what if they are the dominant element in the aquarium so here we see not only do they provide leaves at lower levels which is a structural habitat in its cover the stems uh, break up line of sight they create structural habitat and the leaves at the top create dappled shade cover a sense of security for fish here we can see uh, Munchausia decora darting between the uh, stems and uh, yeah, this video shows, you know, we've got piranha in there, we've got the crora in there. Um, it's a really interesting habitat and you can mix it in with, with stuff like the ceratophyllum. Um, and this is a fantastic habitat for many small fish. 
who go in and hide from predators. Unfortunately, the predators do follow them. Uh, pike cichlids will often go in here to try and hunt smaller fishes through the, uh, the dense beds of lilies. Um, and it's a great, but it is safer than uh, the main river channel. So again, it acts as sort of a creche for many smaller species who will spend the dry season here. And as they mature and as they feed up, they uh, will eventually move back into the main river channel when the waters recede. When they do recede, uh, life can become quite difficult. Uh, food items quickly are used up by any remaining fish. Oxygen levels can drop. Many large fish that are, remain in the, in the uh, bayers, they can actually die from uh, lack of oxygen. Uh, and there's no way to get, get out of there. Once the lagoon is disconnected from the river, you're trapped. Um, but there's still quite a bit of marginal vegetation along sort of shallow, shallow parts along the bank. And that provides habitat for small fish, particularly uh, killifish and small caracins. So you can see here is uh, one of the, the lagoons in the dry season. You can see that the surrounding landscape still got some water in there. Um, it's probably slowly evaporating away, draining away. But all of this area would normally be underwater. And you can now understand how fish that are out in the flooded countryside receded back into the lagoon. And then if they're smart, they quickly go back to the river uh, before it's cut off. Um, those that don't have to contend with a number of problems. Uh, for instance, the Jabudu stork here likes to stalk the shallow waters, uh, hunting for small fish, uh, particularly uh, swamp eels as well, but catfish. Um, and you can see here on the left how the surrounding vegetation, which is marginal and semi-aquatic, is now left sort of fairly high and dry. Um, and the lagoon is really reduced in size. The main plant that dominates during the dry season remains the Ceratophyllum uh, demersum, uh, which can live in turbid conditions, it can live in shallow water. Uh, in the tropical sunlight, it turns a lovely uh, shade of red, and you can see it provides this sort of tower, this structural maze-like habitat through which fish are still moving and winding. And they like to hang out here because they're constantly under threat from predators like giant river otters, who like to go into the lagoons and they can just spend all day chasing the fish round and round and round until the fish tire out or eventually make a mistake. So this kind of uh, uh, habitat where plants and uh, ways to escape and hide from predators remain is very important. Then there's the open areas of uh, silt and it's quite common to see stingrays there foraging for uh, freshwater mollusks, snails and also crabs and also they will hunt other small fish that might be trying to hide out in the substrate. It's along the margins, um, there's still you know, enough water for, for small fish to uh, hold out. And they will sort of move in and out of uh, the remaining aquatic vegetation. Um, and you can see this piranhas are here, there's the freshwater dogfish and uh, serpe tetras on the right. And again, this would be an interesting biotope uh, perhaps to set up you know, the edge of a, of a lagoon with a mixture of semi-aquatic marginal vegetation, perhaps some ceratophyllum, areas of open silty beds, floating plants, uh, collapsed uh, papyrus stems and fronds. And uh, yeah, it's quite a dynamic and, and interesting habitat. So dry season progresses uh, even further. You can see it's, things are really getting bleak here. It's, the water's often quite murky. Uh, it's harder to see things. On the days that it's clear, it's, it's, it's great. Um, but uh, it's not always easy to actually find any fish uh, in this very sort of murky, dark, shadowy habitat. Um, however, unless the droughts are really, really tough, enough water remains for even large fish, uh, if they're not eaten by predators, to survive until the, the wet season starts again. Uh, water starts to drain in from the rivers, they're able to reconnect with the main river channel, they can move out and feed again. Um, but uh, they have to be lucky because they have to survive many, many months in essentially a sort of a trap. Um, I've got a clip in there that just shows uh, algae beds form uh, in the lagoon as well. As lots of aquatic plants die back, what nutrients remain uh, suddenly provide a boom for, for algae. And so I know that algae is uh, the bane of many aquarists, but if you want to create an authentic biotope, uh, you could just fill it with some nice green filamentous algae and some surface chapters and it would, uh, would be correct. So, as I mentioned, the turbid conditions mean that many other plants can't survive, although the hornwort continues. 
uh, the water leaders have gone, all of the structural habitat that they provided has disappeared, and the exposed substrate is uh, now habitat for stingrays. You can see this one here that I've managed to startle him, and his you know, first reaction is bury themselves. When we're doing our field work, we have to be very careful because we walk through these uh, bayers, and uh, it's very easy to step on a uh, buried stingray. So it's one of our, one of our main uh, concerns when we're doing field work. Another uh, crucial bit of habitat are lakes. So there's several man-made reservoirs in the Slobra Delta, but we also have some natural lakes and large ponds. Um, in the wet season, they are really fascinating habitats. Uh, lots of different species move in from the river channel. So lentic species come from the river and lotic species, those that prefer slower water movement, are already there, uh, and such as many of the cichlids. And uh, you've got lots of aquatic vegetation developing, um, lots of water lilies, the beds of water hyacinth. Uh, we've got fish such as uh, Tricorthius nematurus, which is sort of the uh, known as freshwater sardines here. We get freshwater needlefish in there. Um, and getting in with the camera is, is quite fun because you see a, a great diversity of fishes and also quite a few that you don't see frequently in the main river channel. They prefer to live in the lakes. So in these clips here, I think they should their loads, you see uh, the lakes are often home to large cichlids such as uh, Astronautus crespinus. Um, I think they should load, yeah. Small tetras as well, Hemigramus ulrei, Hephaesobrachon uh, eggies and Hephaesobrachon megalopterus. There's Pistogramma combrae darting around, Mukazi forestae. Um, so the lakes are really rich in the wet season. All this water is pouring in, bringing in nutrients. Um, there's lots of uh, macro habitat along the margins where fish can uh, hide and raise uh, young and small fish can grow up. So again, for a biotope project, if you want to do, you know, Pantanal Lake in the wet season, you can blend it with uh, marginal and fully aquatic vegetation. Uh, I think there's Iconia azuria there as well. And uh, you can create this sort of shadow worlds or areas of open, well-lit substrate. And be very interesting setup. Um, so one of the things I like to do when I'm there is I leave a camera on the, uh, the lake bed and I go for a walk for half an hour or so and then I come back and I see what's turned up on the footage. Uh, it's often quite satisfying. The cichlids tend to be very curious. Uh, they come up and, uh, and want to check out the camera, also the, the dogfish as well. And um, the top clip is actually where one lake is draining into another. And because you've got this flux of nutrients and, and uh, debris and items, lots of small fish gather to feed on this, sort of picking them out of the current. And they are followed by the predators like the piranhas um, and uh, also even the Oscar cichlids, the dogfish. So you can see a lot of activity. Uh, the bottom video I quite like is Cichlis amidimerus, very curious, uh, engaging fish. And you can see why so many people are charmed by cichlids. However, in the dry season, lakes are not a great place to be. Um, as you can see, again, there's this progression of the water levels start to drop, uh, recedes into the main basin of the lake, the marginal vegetation on the edges is sort of left in this very silty, stagnant, boggy condition. Um, but as the months go by, even that dries out, you get this sort of caked uh, lake bed and just a few pools of water remain. Um, it's not a great place if you're a fish because lots and lots of caiman crocodiles, uh, oh, caiman, sorry, gather in, in the lake. At night, if you put a, a torch across them, you see hundreds of pairs of eyes gazing back at you. Um, the temperature rises, the oxygen is depleted, there's less water for fish to escape into, less uh, structural vegetation for them to escape into, and you can get to the point that nearly all the larger and medium-sized fish in a lake are, are eaten or die from um, uh, environmental conditions. Uh, where water does remain and there's floating plants, uh, you get fish using that as a refuge, so you've got some Oscar cichlids hiding here under the uh, Iconium, and on the bottom you've got juvenile Crenicicla lepidota hanging out in this habitat. Again, a really easy biotope project would be to have a tank with some decent lighting and Iconia crassipinus in there and a sort of silty sandy bottom. And there's a large number of fish that exist very happily in that kind of environment. You could even uh, rise and, and lower the water level over the months to simulate the, uh, the floods and the, the droughts. So 
Another favorite habitat of mine is the water meadows, as you saw in the photo earlier, uh, of the, the whole area being flooded. Lots of the surrounding landscape uh, it suddenly is now underwater in the, in the wet season. Lots of marginal vegetation and also terrestrial vegetation. A lot of the terrestrial plants there, they can handle being underwater uh, for months and months and months. They don't die back. Um, and they, that means you get this very dynamic structural habitat, which, as I've mentioned, many fish will move into uh, feeding, to breed, to hide from predators. Um, there's a, on the photo on the bottom left, the stingrays will also move out the main river channel and they particularly hunt for the giant apple snails, which we know from the UK are, I think are now banned, um, but are native to this region. And they will, the snails will dig into this loamy soil um, in the meadows and the rays go out and try and sort of dig them out. So here you can see this is a small bit of meadow that's flooded. Initially, the high sunlight penetration and the clear water means that all the terrestrial plants are smothered with algae and cyanobacteria and lots of fish like these little uh, Cyphocarax gili, they'll move in to graze uh, the algae that grows on the, on the stem. So actually I observed quite a few fish that we might consider uh, you know, perhaps a bit more uh, carnivorous in terms that they would feed on microorganisms, quite happily grazing on algae. Uh, so a lot of our tetras that we are familiar with at home, um, they do have a significant part of a vegetable like or algae diet and that's something we can replicate in our home aquaria and so for example we've got the rathbun's tetra apiocarus rathbunae in the top clip here i noticed that they move out of the, the river and into the flooded meadows and they spend hours and hours happily picking an algae growing on the terrestrial plants and when you collect them there you find that they are very 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 green rich green bodies and i wonder if that's because of the large amount of uh, vegetation they're consuming and the bottom video is uh, just of the stingrays that you find in the flooded meadows. When they get startled, they, uh, they'll dig themselves into the substrate and this cloud of detritus comes up. Comes up. Um, it's an escape mechanism. Um, and it's quite impressive how such large fish can sort of disappear quite quickly. So here's an example of a bit of flooded meadow. So this is just a small, if you like, pool. Uh, the day before, it wasn't there. That suddenly the, the river floods, a bit of the water leaks into this meadow. Uh, three or four days later, this pool no longer existed. But during the time that I was snorting in it, I was able to find uh, pike cichlids, so Crinicicla lepidota, uh, guarding their frog. And this is something you could replicate in a, in a biotope, perhaps with a plant like uh, Polygonum or Persicaria. Um, again, perhaps raising and lowering the, the water level um, to simulate these temporary meadows. Uh, you find predators here as well. We've got uh, uh, the wolf fish, which you find absolutely everywhere. Will obviously follow other species into the meadows. Um, will will you at night particularly? If you look at the torch, hundreds of of, uh, of hoplites of these wolf fish, this flooded habitat. Then the dry season is a different story. Uh, the meadows begin to drain out, water evaporates, water recedes back into the main river channel and tributaries and the nearby lakes. There's still fish there, not largely small species, small tetras, small kerosins. But uh, as the meadows continue to dry out, very silty, uh, boggy substrate full of uh, snail shells and decaying vegetation. Um, lots of decaying icornia and terrestrial plants beginning to sort of creep back over the habitat. However, moisture does remain in the soil and quite a few of the floating plants, uh, Limnovium, lim lim the frog bit, and also icornia, Crassicinus, uh, will survive with their roots down deep in the mud where there's still moisture whilst the rest of the plant burns away. Uh, and when the, when the rains return, they come back to life. And it's one of my favorite things about the Pantanal is that you go and you see this sort of almost yeah, devoid of any aquatic vegetation. And suddenly you come back and there's been some rain and the plants have reappeared. Um, so just uh, summarizing, as I mentioned, as the, as the meadows dry out, they leave this uh, tapestry of, of dead and dying aquatic vegetation. Um, and the substrate is quite loamy, lots of snail shells. Uh, any fish that have not managed to escape back into the main river before it dries out, become prey or, or 
die. Um, and this, uh, this dynamic in the past now of the flood pulse cycle is what we call a lot of the fauna and flora completely reliant on this, uh, this system. So when I talk about aquatic plants, for example, we know lots of us have uh, water lilies in our tanks. We know that they grow from a, a rhizome. Um, so you can find as the meadows dry out, you see these big rhizomes in the, in the mud. And uh, then when the rains begin to come back, the first bit of rain, sometimes not even enough to cover the, the soil, the lilies will germinate. They'll put out some leaves, as you can see in the, in the middle uh, photo. It's humid enough for the leaves to lie flat on the mud and, and not dry out. And then perhaps another day or two of rain or a week, and suddenly the landscape is covered in all these lilies. I think this is an inferior James Oni, and a species of Eliocaris there in a, in a flooded meadow. And uh, it's one of the most exciting moments for me is to, to turn up at somewhere that previously was a sort of dried out savanna, and now it's this immense tapestry of uh, aquatic plants. And the ability of the plants to, to survive this period is, uh, is unusual. In, Many of us think, you know, oh, our aquatic plants that we have at home, when they dry out, they die, we throw them out. Um, but lots of the stem plants, for instance, uh, uh, Kabomba and Mayaka, the, the actual plant dries out, the roots remain in the mud, but as they, as they sort of dry out, their seeds are deposited in the, in the clay around them. And the dying plant acts as a fertilizer for all those seeds so that when the rains return, the plant, uh, rises again, sort of a Lazarus style, uh, <laughs> botanically. Another kind of habitat that we have there is along the river uh, margins, we've got forests, but beyond that, we've got the savanna habitat, and there's lots of temporary pools, uh, ditches, uh, drainage uh, streams and irrigation streams. You can see here, uh, even in the dry season, they remain some water quite often. Um, and this is a place where you will often find medium or small sized cichlids and small tetras that are basically holding out, waiting for the wet season to come back, reconnect to the main river channel so they can move out of its habitats. They're often quite full of uh, lilies and uh, floating plants of Zola, uh, Salvina, um, Icornia. And along the margins, we often see uh, plants from the family Echinodorus and Ludwigia. So a friend of mine, uh, Wolfram, uh, recorded this uh, the other year in a drainage ditch and you can see these golden wolffish, Hoplerythrinus unicorniatus. So this is a ditch that's isolated now from the, the, from the main river channel. I'm stranded, um, but they are, they're surviving and feeding off not just other small fishes, but here they will prey on small mammals, on, on frogs, on any, uh, anything they can catch, really large insects. So, and you can see some Echinodorus uh, here. So this would be another quite interesting biotope uh, to recreate. Um, and these remaining bodies of water really are lifelines for fish that are caught out in the open savanna during the drought. So, as I was saying, the, uh, these uh, isolated ditches and drainage uh, irrigation streams and, and ponds in the savanna area um, around the, the delta are lifelines for lots of smaller fishes. Uh, in this clip, we've got uh, Moncasi forestry, which is the cousin of the famous Moncasia Sancta Philomene from uh, the Amazon. We've got uh, Hemigramus ulreii and Astyanex lacustris. And uh, there's quite a lot of small fish that will hang out here until the, the rains let them escape. So again, for a biotope project, this might be quite an interesting habitat. Uh, this is a sort of one and a half meter wide, quite shallow uh, stream that drains the landscape. Uh, it's still in existence even during the dry season. Um, the waters are quite clear. And you can see this Cabomba caroliana, it's uh, growing there very densely. Um, along the banks, we've got, uh, I think this is Ludwigia grandiflora, another uh, cypress type plants. Um, we've got Echinodorus uh, growing there, which is Echinodorus grandifolius. Uh, so you can actually quite easily recreate this kind of habitat. Um, and if you stick a camera in there, you start to see, well, here's a clip just showing you what it looks like uh, looking from above. I think there's a, also Bacopla myrilophoides is growing in there. And there's bits of leaf litter, there's some organic material, there's sort of complex material from the complex habitat from the stems of the Ludwigia. And then 
you can see the Kabomba really loving the uh, full strong sun in this habitat. There is a little bit of forest along the edge of the, the ditch, um, but still lots of sunlight penetrates. So we get Echnodorus ventriflorus, Cordifolius, Macrophyllus, uh, the Kabomba. And if I want to show you, so underwater we've got this bed of uh, Kabomba caroliana and this sort of silty substrate, you can see Corydorus aeneas here. And uh, you'll see a few more in a, in a moment. So it's a quite a sort of loamy, silty substrate, which is ideal for Corydoras. As you can see this uh, swarm of uh, Corydoras aeneas here hanging out. And uh, it's great just to leave a camera there and, and observe them. And again, there's, oh, there's a Hyphosobrachal neckies. Um, this would be a very easy biotope to recreate. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's intriguing, it's interesting, it's dynamic and it's uh, simple. Another bit of the habitat is the flooded forest. So the ancillary forest that follows the main river channel, full of large trees and lianas and vines and root networks. You can see in the middle photo the, the watermark on the tree, which is this, in this case about three meters. The water was uh, at its highest point. And it provides this quite sort of mysterious uh, world of, of sunken woody debris and leaves. Uh, quite a few smaller species, particularly histogram, will move into this area. Um, a larger fish that feed on, uh, on fruits and seeds that are falling from the trees also inhabit this kind of habitat. So unlike in the Amazon, the flooded forest in Pantanal is not particularly the main form of habitat. Uh, in Pantanal, it's more flooded grassland. Um, however, the forest is still very important as a habitat um, and as I mentioned there are fruit-eating fish such as Kudipatanga, Brycon hilari, they engage in uh, crugivory and they will feed on fruits that fall from the, the trees but they will also follow groups of monkeys, we've got capuchin monkeys, we've got howler monkeys here and monkeys are very messy eaters um, and they also shake the branches and so as they move into the forest they knock loose uh, fruits from the trees and they only go for the fruits once they're ripe so the fish also know that the fruits that are falling down are ready to go if you like and um, so they will follow the monkeys through the forest and along the, the, uh, the ancillary forest, uh, which is quite unusual to have a relationship between primates and, uh, and fish, but Hansen has lots of intriguing uh, phenomena like that. Obviously, with all that woody material and uh, all the trees around, there's lots of sunken branches and logs. Um, so you can see in the high water, uh, low hanging branches and twiggy material creates quite a complex habitat near the surface. And, and then at the bottom, you've got bits of, of wood and twigs, even small, quite spindly twigs. They act as traps. They catch leaf litter and detritus that's being blown along in the current. Um, and then you get small fish living inside that, uh, that uh, mix of, of organic material. In the dry season, you can see exactly how much habitat there is. So that sort of tangle of roots where you would particularly find uh, small pike cichlids and other cichlids sort of snaking between them um, in the wet season. In the dry season, they lose access to that. So uh, root systems that are holding the banks together and also larger logs that fall in. We find lots of armored catfish um, grazing on, the, on algae and algae, biofilm that's growing on there. You see catfish such as Pimela della Mucosa uh, swimming in the dappled shade underneath uh, roots that have collapsed or branches that have fallen into the river. Small tetras like Hyphosobrachnechis and H. megalopterus here uh, are picking at uh, biofilm growing on the wood. Again, quite easy to recreate a biotope project here. You know, tannins, lots of roots, biofilm, some leaf litter, and some easily uh, purchasable tetras. Where we get larger logs, we often see uh, the wolfish lying against the see uh, the branches at the top here act, act as traps. They've captured the uh, ceratophyllum demersum, so it's swaying in the current. We've got this large log, which was full of armored catfish in the shadows underneath the, the, uh, the, the demersum, which has been caught by the branches. There's fish uh, feeding and hiding. Um, it's a really dynamic and interesting habitat. And again, if we think, oh, we always take ceratophyllum and we think of it as floating or we plant it in the substrate. But what if you had it in a tank with quite a bit of flow and had it sort of wrapped around 
branches that were hanging into the into the water, and underneath that habitat was the main focus of the tank. Um, and it's underwater observation that lets you sort of think of these things and sort of break with tradition a little bit because you see that nature is just so fantastically diverse, um, and we should try to replicate that perhaps in our in our tanks at home. Obviously, I have to mention leaf litter. Anyone who has uh, an interest in South American biotopes, particularly, uh, leaf litter is a big part of that. Um, it uh, forms the basis for food chains in many places. It feeds microorganisms as it decays, and those organisms are consumed by small fishes, which in turn are consumed by large fishes. Um, the decaying material is part of the cycling of nutrients, not just for, for animals, but also returns to the substrate and feeds the growth of, of plants, both aquatic and terrestrial. Uh, here we've got uh, juvenile crenicicular lipidota moving over uh, leaf litter and hunting for small microinvertebrates. You can see those eyes, chameleon-like, uh, locked on trying to find prey. And um, leaf litter isn't always, for example, dense. You can have scattered leaf litter. You can have medium levels of leaf litter. Um, we often think of it as sort of thick beds, but fish will utilize whatever habitat they can find where they think they can find food. Um, as I mentioned earlier, leaf litter often accumulates around, accumulates around uh, twigs and branches, but also around the stems of aquatic plants, which fish will, uh, will hide in, particularly Crenicicla lepidota juveniles like to hide in that. Um, we've got fish such as in the middle here, uh, Histogramma combre, darting through the Um, tetras come in, engaging in that nuclear follower relationship I mentioned earlier, uh, following the larger fish, hoping that something gets uncovered and that they can snaffle up. Uh, just to finish the bit on habitats, um, obviously the fish are constantly under threat from many, many predators. Uh, the Slobra Delta is really rich in terms of uh, av avian fauna um, and another fit predators so they've got there are spiders that hunt fish along the bank at night we've got caiman we've got herons we've got storks we've got egrets we've got kingfishers we've got the river otters which consume a huge amount of large fish uh, over, over over a year and some of the families can contain 40 members so it's quite a lot of uh, predation uh, pressure on the fish community here um, and that also shows you why structural habitats and places that they can hide is so important so understanding the threats that fish face can also help us consider how we would replicate their, uh, their habitat in a biotope. So um, the next bit is talking more about the species that are found in this delta. I'm going to let Michael, I think, come in to uh, take any questions from the arisen so far. Um. Hi, Ty. Yes, there's uh, been a couple of questions, and uh, one of them that's come up is um, we had a question here uh, from um, from um, someone named Slatinisek. Okay, which is what is the depth of the main river tributaries, lakes, and uh, lagoons during between the wet and the dry season? What is the difference there in the depth? Um, and also um, the water parameters, how do those change uh, between the seasons as well? Okay. So if you can give us any indication of like that, that kind of variation there. It's difficult with depth because it, it, as I say, it can change from one day to the next. And we can have extremes where perhaps the main river channel is, uh, and the, the flooded forest is up to three meters underwater. Um, in the wet season and the lakes are normally around two meters, the lagoons about anything to two, two and a half meters in, in depth. Um, many of the smaller bodies of water, so the ponds and the streams and ditches, range from anything from 30 centimeters to perhaps uh, half a meter in depth. Uh, but then in the dry season that can really fall, so the tributaries can completely dry out or keep sort of going along with maybe two or three centimeters of water. Many of the ponds will evaporate. The lakes, you get perhaps 15, 20 centimeters of water, but it's, it's more mud than water. Um, the main river channel, even in the dry season, you still get water about a meter and a half at times, but sometimes much less, sometimes half a meter in depth. And um, so it's, it really fluctuates. 
as does, but the water parameters don't change that radically. Sorry, it's just a tropical rainstorm started here, so I'm just closing the windows to, <laughs> so you can hear me. Um, excuse me. Um, so the, the parameters we found, the temperatures were generally 27 degrees was fairly standard um, throughout, throughout the year. Um, pH was normally about 6.5 to 7, so it's not as, as acidic as we would think perhaps these, uh, these habitats are. Um, if anyone wants more detailed parameters, they can get in touch with me perhaps via Instagram or, by, or Facebook and I can look at my field notes that I recorded at the time. Um, but it's, it's a fairly stable in terms of uh, water parameters, which is interesting because there are times, as I mentioned to Michael before, that we would go, that it can actually have frosts in the Pantanal. So you don't really think of your Serpe Tetris swimming around in a body of water where the grass is, is frozen along the bank, but they can handle it. And part of it is that um, there's enough water, uh, even during the, the cooler periods of the dry season, in many habitats for the temperature change to not happen uh, so quickly. Um, but during the, the two years that I was doing regular uh, collection trips, um, yeah, it didn't fluctuate much more than between 6.5 to 7 pH, about 27 to, to 31 degrees uh, across various habitats. Um, and any further, further details I'm happy to uh, share. Great, thanks a lot, Ty. And the, uh, related to that question is the, the, how do the turbidity and the level of tannins in the water change between seasons? And I mean, my uh, add-on to that is, is it possible to maybe replicate some of these changes, seasonal changes in a biotope? Um, besides the water level, uh, anything about water conditions, perhaps, or flow rate? Yeah, I mean, flow flow is easily turned up or down. You know, if you want to recreate dry season in a in a in the river, turn up the flow. Um, alternately, if it was a tributary habitat, you you reduce it because there's not that much water anymore. It's sort of stagnant bits of water. Um, you could increase. Uh, the tannins that you add to a tank, so either you know in liquid form or in um, uh, leaf litter, uh, there are people which will cause changes in pH. Although you do need to do that over a period of time, you don't want to suddenly shock your fish with a pH change. You could alternate the temperature a bit, so you could raise the temperature closer to 30, 31 degrees to simulate the dry season, and lower it in the wet season. Um, in terms of Turbidity, it's difficult in an aquarium to make a water, you know, to make the water contain more or less sediment held in the water column. Um, although if you had a, a tank with lots of organic debris on the bottom and a, and a powerful filter blasting it around, uh, that could be your, your dry season biotope. Um, we had another question uh, on what type of camera you're using to take these videos as uh, they like, they think the videos look very clear. Okay, I use a, an Olympus TG5 uh, tough camera um, and some of the photos are taken just with the camera itself um, but I have bought from a company called Backscatter. Uh, it's a PT058 housing that you can put the camera in. The camera can be underwater as well but the housing just helps you um, to stabilize the shots. I have a sort of a handle that I hold and I also bought a backscatter uh, dome lens, so I can do those sort of half in and half out shots, get some wide angle shots. Um, I think Olympus has released a TG6 already. Um, they're not that expensive in terms of what cameras normally cost, and they're pretty good. Um, and as they don't always do so well in, uh, in low light conditions, but when there's decent uh, sunlight, they, they produce some nice photos. Uh, we had another question. Thanks, Ty. We had another question about uh, the Crinocicla lepidota. Yeah. Um, and how large does it grow in these habitats? Okay, so um, generally maybe 15 centimeters is a big adult female. Um, they can get quite sort of chunky, you know, cigar-like uh, shape. Um, it's more common to see individuals perhaps 12 centimeters or so. Um, and for people who are interested in keeping them in the tank, I must point out that they will eat everything and anything they can. If it can fit in their mouth, they will eat it. 
And lots of people think of these bike cichlids as, you know, oh, they're compatible with sort of medium sized tetras. No, if they will try to eat anything. So just be aware. <laughs> So uh, this is really in useful information because, you know, we, we, even also, although you may see these uh, fish together in the wild habitat in the footage, uh, that doesn't mean they can necessarily coexist in a tank. Uh, there's lots of cases where you might see, you know, lions on the Serengeti and there are gazelles in the background. The lions are just not hungry at that time and yeah. so on. So that's a, a very fair point there. Um, we had another question, uh, which season do the stingrays breed in the dry or the wet season? That's a good question. From, from what I've seen in uh, my friends here who are breeding them in captivity, uh, Pantanal crescent, they seem to breed largely all year round as long as there's enough oh, food. Okay. Uh, if, if there's enough food f for females to, to be in good condition, in breeding condition, um, they will breed. I mean, the males don't really leave the females uh, alone. Um, but I think if, if it's a lean year, if there's not much uh, uh, in terms of prey items uh, or at a particular time of the year, then they're less inclined to breed. Um, but from what I understand from my colleagues here, in captivity, they breed all the time. Um, and you do see them even in the dry season, you see quite large you know, females that look like they might be in breeding condition. Um, so it seems to be more nutrition dependent than season season yeah. dependent. This is true with quite um, a few of the fish there. So. I had a question for you, um, and sure. that's related once again to the predators. Um, I'd like to just uh, know your view on the uh, trend of monster fish keeping uh, keeping things like stingrays. Uh, even arowana, um, the, the large peacock cichlids, um, hoplius, and so on. Uh, what are your views on, on keeping these in captivity? Are we able to provide a habitat that's suitable for them? And of course, the, the monster catfish, like the red-tailed cats and things like that. Uh, at the risk of offending lots of people, my short answer is no. Um, <laughs> unless you have a heated indoor swimming pool, a lot of these fish, I mean, they should just not be kept in a tank, especially after observing them in the wild. Yes, a hoplius will sit motionless on the riverbed for 10 hours a day and do nothing. But it has the option to cross, you know, tens of square kilometers of, of, of underwater habitat. Um, you, you will never be able to simulate the space and the dynamics that are available to these fish. Uh, for instance, arowana. I looked after arowana at London Zoo. We had a 30,000 liter tank with arowana which is decent space for large arowana. But um, arowana feed in the wild, their diet is 90% spiders and they leap to catch these spiders. So their eyes are orientated slightly more upwards. If you feed, if you have them in a tank, say with other species that are benthnic, so need pellets that sink, arowana are opportunists, they will also go for the pellets. So what happens, you get the drooping eye and now their eyes are pointing downwards. So you're changing the morphology of your fish based on not feeding them appropriately, keeping them in conditions. And that's just one example with arowana, but you'll get that with rays as well. You'll get stunting, you can have uh, uh, problems with internal organs, with bone structure. Um, the stimulus of feeding many of these predators, there's a question of ethics, depending on the country that you're in on, you know, feeding live foods. And I think only public institutions in Aquaria who can really give a decent home and exhibit these animals um, as they should be, should be allowed to keep them unless there was a, say, a license system, someone who's absolutely stark raving mad for red-tailed catfish and are prepared to turn their garage into an indoor, you know, deep pond, tropical pond, okay. But even then, I mean, red-tailed cats are known to migrate hundreds and hundreds of kilometers. Um, yeah. And, and will quite happily consume prey almost to their own body size. So. Yeah. I mean, uh, I th I'm not sure if I sent that to you. The uh, someone had posted their koi uh, display with the red-tailed cat in there. 
uh, with the koi. I mean, uh, long term, not a good, <laughs> not a good uh, way to do it. I fully agree with you on this. I think Aquarius, if they want, if they want to keep predators, there's loads of smaller and medium-sized predators that you could also keep. Um, I mean, outside of the live food or not issue, but at least that you can provide a suitable habitat for them. And uh, uh, just from my own experience, I've seen lots of stunted, squashed looking red tail catfish and um, uh, the arowana with injuries or the drop eye, which they actually will, will take, I think, a razor blade or do some minor surgery to try to correct this uh, in some cases to, to stop the permanently uh, down facing eyes. Um, yeah, there are loads of things like that uh, that occur and and for some reason, um, I guess the laws haven't sort of caught up with those. They have in some countries, uh, but they haven't in a lot of places. So that's a, a great observation. I think it's something that's often overlooked. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it, there's if, if you can flood your entire basement, uh, you know, that's one thing. Um, if you want a predator that you can provide for in an aquarium, well, there's there's small. Now that brings me to one other, which are the pikes, uh, the um, pike cherisons, the the sort of freshwater barracuda. Are any of those small enough that that you could possibly house them uh, well? My only ex experiences with uh, uh, ancestral hinkus pantanera, seeing them here in in the wild, um, they're very active fish. Um, they will quite happily smash themselves into the glass if they startle and, and break their their snouts and damage their teeth yep. if you had a very very large you know 4,000 liter sort of setup you might be able to house a, a trio or three of them but they they also need the stimulus really of live prey um, yep. they can snap a bit amongst themselves they need yeah it's, it's, it's the that, that sounds again like creation you want predatory pike anything, go for something like some of the pike cichlids. There are many pike cichlids, which are also not only, they, they're, they're beautiful, but they have really interesting uh, behavior, they're intelligent, they, uh, their, their behavior between them, the way that they raise young is fascinating. Um, so there's, there's options out there. But um, yeah, anything from Ancestral Hincus, apparently is difficult. So, I mean, that comes back to your idea of maybe something like a licensing system. Uh, it is possible someone might have a four or 5,000 liter tank and, and you know, be able to provide for it. But m for most hobbyists, not the case, exactly. I mean, I, I, I often see also things like uh, tiger fish, uh, you know, from the Congo uh, in, in aquaria. Um, yeah. There's no way almost anyone can provide for even the very common things like ID sharks and so on the Asian catfish. It, it gets to, you know, almost at least 1.5 meters, the, the size of the tank that it's in. So, um, yeah. That and then I have uh, another question. What, what is the... Oh, oh, I think you've kind of answered this, the minimum volume for the stingrays. Um, okay, so uh, something else. Oh, about the German uh, rams, uh, the, the ram, uh, ram cichlids. Um, are they comfortable in a low-tech plant uh, setup? Um, or do they require something like a blackwater tank? Um, so the, the Microgeophagus ramirezi, um, they're not found in this region. I mean, they're from the Orinoco region, it's close to Venezuela, but from looking at um, photos, both from uh, Ivan Mikolai and also the, the fantastic book, uh, The Amazon Underwater, there were photos of rams in fairly clear water habitats in a sort of savanna type landscape, very similar to the Pantanal. And yeah. I think in, uh, it was Oliver Lucanus who has the uh, Amazon Underwater. His, one of his photos shows some rams in fairly clear water, hanging out amongst some uh, uh, filamentous algae and, and, and stems of, of, of grasses. So it wasn't your classic black water leaf litter habitat, um, but I haven't seen them in the wild, so I can't, I can't pronounce much more on that. But I think someone like uh, Oliver Lucanus or Ivan Mikolai 
uh, would be the guys to either their images or perhaps in messaging them, they would be the guys to tell you about that. Great. Okay, uh, Ty, I think we can continue with the next section. So right. please uh, proceed. Do that. Thank <laughs> you. 